So um, Paolo actually asked me to come and give uh, a little bit of a, an overview of uh, what's happening in Moderna, and more importantly, uh, what is uh, now messenger RNA and what is the future for messenger RNA. As you know, messenger RNA is recognized as a virus, uh, and uh, therefore it was very obvious uh, for us uh, to use it as a, a, a vessel to create a potentially great vaccine. And uh, fortunately, it happened, and it happened with a speed that uh, nobody actually could uh, even imagine. So in uh, 42 days, uh, the, the vaccine was ready from uh, the concept to proof of concept and actually for the first while uh, delivered to NIH. That tells you that we are in a different uh, era for uh, science and technology. And that's why we thought that uh, probably mRNA not only can be a great uh, uh, sort of uh, vessel for a vaccine, but it's also uh, potentially one of the uh, future therapeutics. And uh, today I want to give you some, uh, an overview of uh, what we, uh, we've done and what we need uh, in order to make an RNA uh, a prodrug, the perfect prodrug to then translate uh, the protein that is needed uh, to, uh, uh, for, uh, for the uh, needed function. So um, basically, uh, we made it as a platform, right? Because we thought uh, messenger RNA can make uh, any type of protein. And so in order to uh, say that we do have a platform, we need to meet certain characteristics for messenger RNA. And uh, obviously, one is a man needs. So whatever, whatever else we can do, and more importantly, whatever, uh, which other patients we can uh, address with this type of technology. Uh, obviously, we wanted to have uh, a, prob a probability of technical success. And I think uh, at this point, the spike vax uh, prove uh, that uh, uh, we do actually uh, have uh, an, an, an mRNA uh, as a therapeutic. Uh, and also, it should allow you to enable uh, uh, accelerated research and development talents. Uh, it's amazing, we, uh, I will give you an example uh, of uh, a rare genetic disorder where uh, we are in clinical trial. And I think we are the first uh, company in a messenger RNA being in a clinic, in, actually in three clinical trials and starting three more this year in rare genetic disorder rather than just the vaccine and then potentially uh, cancer. And uh, so uh, it, it is interesting how you can expedite uh, uh, the uh, idea of uh, creating a therapeutic, uh, and even for the propionic acidemia, which I'll present uh, later, from uh, the concept to proof of concept was only six months uh, in uh, generating all the data in animal models uh, to then have a lead candidate that now is actually in the clinic. So I'll give you all uh, these uh, um, uh, example. But it, it, it's interesting that uh, I hear all the issues with uh, manufacturing, uh, with uh, obviously uh, gene therapy, and uh, messenger RNA doesn't have these issues. As a matter of fact, Moderna, I think, was uh, a very clever company in the sense in investing a lot of money up front uh, in understanding uh, all the processes uh, in order to create the drug. And that's why now we can manufacture on a large scale without any issues with a high quality control. So uh, one of the difference also that uh, uh, messenger RNA offers now is uh, the ability to make any type of proteins. Uh, we can uh, make now transmembrane protein, we can make mitochondrial protein, uh, uh, things that uh, before were unimaginable. Uh, and we, um, in fact, enzyme replacement therapy uh, was possible mainly because these proteins are soluble, and so they can actually made and uh, uh, sort of uh, shaped in the right way with the right sugars. Uh, but uh, uh, that was it. So we had the limitation on only secreted protein. Now with the messenger RNA, you can see that we can open the space to every type of uh, replacement. Also for those uh, genes or those proteins that have been uh, very difficult to make uh, uh, by nature. <clears throat> and so uh, obviously, um, <clears throat> We had uh, to have uh, an integrated organization in, in order to make all of this. Uh, the me messenger RNA therapeutic is actually composed by messenger RNA, and it can be multiplex, meaning that uh, you can combine as many uh, messenger RNA as you want. Uh, obviously, we try to understand every single part and every single uh, domain of the messenger RNA and every single uh, function of the messenger RNA just to have a, a better sense on how eventually it will behave once it's delivered. One of the beautiful things of the messenger RNA compared to gene therapy is actually that it's dose responsive. 
which means that every time you give X amount of messenger RNA, you get always X amount of protein made. And that's mathematical and is also allometrically scaled to the point that you can go now from mice to human and choose the efficacious dose pretty accurately. And so it's actually quite nice to have that because then you start to get close to almost personalized precision medicine type of approach. The other interesting thing is that it has a reproducible pharmacology, which obviously include repeat dosing. Unfortunately, you know messenger RNA is not very stable, and in fact, 30 years ago, probably nobody would have thought that we could make a therapeutic with messenger RNA because of the instability, because of nucleases, because everything. You could look at messenger RNA, it would disappear in a second. Now we know enough to actually be able to stabilize it, but more importantly, to de-immunize the messenger RNA so that now it can become a true therapeutic where our immune system doesn't see the messenger RNA anymore as a virus, but actually as a, as a sequence then that can be translated. So uh, we can actually achieve uh, uh, potency, the right potency, so the therapeutic index is the most important thing. Uh, depending on the different replacement of different uh, protein or enzyme, uh, you know that you need to uh, achieve a certain threshold uh, in order to have efficacy. And uh, with messenger RNA, because he, uh, uh, he's uh, dose responsive, uh, you can actually start to understand that you, if you are going to meet that particular goal for that disease. Uh, and so it gives you a, li a little bit more of uh, confidence that once you go into uh, a human patients, uh, you might be able to see uh, a response. Uh, obviously, uh, and now I'll show you later, uh, that's to be safe and well tolerated. And now we have collected data for more than one year in a clinical trial in a regenerative disorder where the patients are very fragile, they can die very easily, and they are fine. They've been taking now the therapy for a year and a half, and they're still responding and doing well. So that tells you that there's also safety and tolerability. We actually we don't even do pre-medications for the infusions, suggesting that actually we do actually have a system that is quite well accepted by the, the human body. And then obviously we have all the manufacturing part that now we own and allow us in case of pandemics to transfer the technology for large CMOs that can make a lot of material for us or in a, in a normal case, we can even manufacture as many as 100 messenger RNA per day, uh, supporting 100 clinical trials and the post uh, clinical trial, because now we use a, a semi-synthetic process and it's very reproducible, and, but more importantly, it's more bioreactor that they can feed in rooms very easily. And so you can uh, think of uh, making as many as 100 uh, messenger RNA therapeutic per day. So, <clears throat> Everything that we do uh, for the messenger RNA is engineered uh, uh, in-house. From the lipid nanoparticle, we have our own proprietary amino lipids, our own pegs. We look at the structure of the lipid nanoparticle, everything that is important also for FDA in terms of quality control. And in terms of, uh, instead, the messenger RNA, we do everything possible to understand primary structure, secondary structure, uh, codon optimization, uh, chemistry of the nucleosides, everything possible that would allow us for not only the best translation possible of the protein, but potentially we can also engineer uh, to start to give a, uh, a better half-life of the protein, a better outcome for the particular, a higher enzymatic activity. Because at this point, uh, and I will show you later, it's interesting that once uh, you deliver messenger RNA to the liver of uh, our patients, uh, even, you give it to, even if you give it to a naive patient, it seems that our immune system started to recognize that particular product as its own. And the reason is that we think that because of all the process of translation of the messenger RNA and post-translational modification happen in a very natural way, to the point that uh, even our immune system start to sort of accept it and recognize it as is. More importantly, the post translational modifications are natural, once again, uh, which uh, uh, sort of differentiate for what uh, enzyme replacement therapy has been doing, and that's why they've been having issues with anti-drug antibodies. But, but so far, uh, we haven't seen uh, those uh, happening, uh, and even in patients now that they've been on therapy for more than a year and a half. 
So the messenger array that we make basically looks like uh, exactly what it's supposed to be um, the, uh, this in, in terms of structure. So obviously it's capped, has a five prime UTR, uh, open reading frame that obviously will uh, um, basically translate for the protein, and then the three prime UTR and the poly tail. Obviously we made modification to those uh, in order to enhance stabilization, and also we have learned, for example, that uh, in order to enhance the translatability of the messenger RNA, if you modify slightly the 5' prime UTR, you can increase uh, the affinity to ribosome uh, as much as uh, five times more than the endogenous messenger RNA. So you can imagine that now, uh, with our capabilities, uh, we can create an incredible uh, messenger RNA that could even treat autosomal dominant disorder, even when you have uh, a dominant negative, because uh, the amount of protein that you make uh, coming from our messenger RNA it would be much larger compared to the amount of protein that would be made by the endogenous one. And so that gives you the opportunity now to understand of how to treat different uh, uh, diseases in a different way with dosing, et cetera, et cetera. Also, we can make a, a tissue selective. And so in the three prime uh, uh, UTR, we can actually encode, uh, for example, a specific recognition size for uh, um, tissue-specific microRNA. So, for example, if you don't want uh, your protein to be translated in the spleen, because obviously you have immune cells uh, that could be prime with a, a new protein, uh, you can actually encode a particular uh, microRNA recognition site that they are very specific for the spleen. Uh, and so when the messenger RNA gets transduced uh, and then when, uh, is released into the cytosol, uh, the microRNA recognizes it right away because they have very high affinity for this uh, sequence, uh, and they take it into degradation pathway. So the messenger RNA won't be translated in the spleen, but will certainly be translated in the liver where you want it to be. And so we have a way also to make it a little bit uh, tissue specific, if you, uh, if you will. But uh, to be a therapeutic, as I mentioned at the very beginning, uh, you have to bypass uh, the immune response. Uh, as I said, uh, uh, RNA will be recognized as a virus, right? And so um, it's important to understand what uh, caused uh, that recognition. Uh, and uh, there were many publications suggesting that, in fact, the uridine uh, are the culprit uh, in terms of uh, <coughs> um, re uh, the immune recognition. And uh, immune recognition happened at the level of the uh, heterodimer of the toll-like receptor 7 and 8, which they recognize easily the uridine of a messenger RNA. And then they initiated an interferon cascade and cytokine release, et cetera, et cetera. And also, sometimes uh, the, uh, the messenger RNA, as it is, uh, can create double-stranded uh, uh, RNAs. And those are actually triggering the derigai uh, type of uh, mechanism of immune activation. So uh, you want to minimize uh, all these aspects in order to get an RNA that is immune silent that, that then is going to translate uh, the, the protein that you need. So uh, what we uh, did, uh, we look at uh, uridine, in fact, and we realized that in the natural synthesis of the uridine, there are a couple of uh, uh, uridine, uh, methyl and methoxy uh, uh, uridine that, uh, that now we use. And the moment that you substitute this uridine with a methyl or methoxy uridine, basically you bypass the ability to bind uh, to the uh, toll-like receptor 7 and 8, because that little methyl group uh, in N5 uh, has actually the ability to create enough uh, steric hindrance uh, uh, for the uridine then to sear uh, inside the pocket of the, uh, the heterodimer, uh, the, res uh, the receptor's heterodimer. And that, one, uh, that allows us uh, really to bypass, uh, at this point, the immune response. The other interesting thing is that if you use a pseudo-uridine, uh, you don't have any more the ability to create double-stranded RNA. And so, in the end, our product is single-stranded RNA, completely be, uh, fully capped and fully polyethyl and fully sequenced so that you get 100% reliability of what you are going to put into a human being, which is going to be translated, translating always the same protein. Not pieces of it, not portion of it, but just the full length sequence. And that's very important because all these other noises that you can find in your product could create uh, potentially a lot of issues. And that's why we engineer the capping enzyme, the T7 polymerase. Everything is engineered to create these uh, sort of uh, 
perfect if you will, <laughs> uh, uh, therapeutic. The lipid nanoparticle are actually uh, kind of interesting in the way we make it. Uh, they, uh, as you know, lipid nanoparticle, they uh, very much look like uh, uh, cell membranes. And uh, um, we have our own am uh, amino lipids, which are ionizable, but also they're, they're hydrolyzable. And the reason why we make them hydrolyzable is that uh, the moment that they get released into the cytosol, uh, the cytosol be, uh, being aqueous, uh, it actually degrades the lipid nanoparticle very fast, so you don't have accumulation of, the, of your vehicle, of delivery vehicle, right? And so in the end, the only things that you get into the cells is your RNA ready to be translated. And uh, the other things that we do, unfortunately, these lipid nanoparticles love PEGs, uh, particularly for stability and uh, for uh, uh, the uh, creation of this uh, perfect spheroid, as you see in the picture, which, by the way, quality control and FDA very much look into this because they want to be sure that they give an homogeneous drug. And uh, uh, so what we do, because the, unfortunately, as uh, humans, uh, we, uh, we are floated with uh, anti-GG for PEGs because on a daily basis we use toothpaste, we use creams, that they're full of PEGs, and so we are making anti-PEG antibodies. And so what we did, because these PEGs are so important for the structure, what we did, we actually made them as well hydrolyzable. So in the moment that the PEG hit an aqueous phase, like for example, if you give it in an infusion, the PEG will shed from the lipid nanoparticle, and now the lipid nanoparticle is able to uh, bind to its own receptor and, and get delivered, while the PEG is going to be bound by the IgG that uh, in a normal situation would actually create the steric interest that would uh, avoid for lipid nanoparticle binding to its own receptor. And this is how it works. Basically, you give it in the system, and then uh, the moment that it gets into the system, the PEG sheds, and then you see now that you have your free lipid nanoparticle. At this point, the size of the shape is not important anymore. The most important thing is that uh, uh, the moment that it gets uh, 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 endosomed by the cells, uh, then it gets uh, uh, released, uh, it gets to release the messenger DNA for translation. And we know uh, that, that this is actually happening as we actually have a rapid dissociation and diffusion. <laughs> so, one of the things that is very important, uh, which has caused a lot of issues, uh, particularly during, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, during the pandemic, is that uh, there were a lot of belief that the messenger RNA is using human cells, is using animal product, no such things. Uh, the process is semi-synthetic. Everything is biodegradable. Uh, and what we use, uh, basically, is our body to process uh, messenger RNA to process uh, uh, lipids, to process everything in a very natural way. Also, we use uh, uridine, that they're pseudo-uridine, but they're part of the natural uh, synthesis of the uridine. So everything that you have has been processed by your body naturally without forcing any mechanism or without forcing any particular chem uh, chemical reaction. And so uh, this is how uh, uh, the uh, LMP gets delivered, uh, goes in the system uh, through the sinusoid, uh, and then uh, uh, sheds the peg. At that point, uh, the lipid can uh, opsonize with APOE, and then uh, by uh, opsonizing with APOE, they can bind to the LDL receptor, create the endosome, and then because they are um, extremely ionizable, meaning that they are extremely uh, positively rich, uh, and with the uh, pH changes in the endosome and transforming into the lysosome, uh, you can imagine that there, uh, there will be an explosion in, term, in terms of uh, lipid nanoparticle uh, breaking the endosome and releasing the messenger RNA. And that's why we get uh, an incredible uh, amount of uh, translated protein using the, um, um, our messenger RNA. And uh, so obviously you need, uh, uh, for different therapeutic areas also, we have created different uh, um, um, routes of administrations. Uh, we are working actually with those, the first patients uh, for cystic fibrosis in collaboration with uh, uh, Vertex. Uh, um, and these patients uh, get uh, aerosolized uh, lipid nanoparticle containing uh, messenger RNA for uh, uh, CFTR. Uh, for uh, a regenerative disorder, we have two different types of lipids uh, that they have different types of receptor binding. And
and uh, we are trying to maximize uh, and understand the distribution of these as much as we can because it's important uh, also for certain uh, diseases where the therapeutic index is very high that you get enough distribution uh, through all, uh, the, uh, the liver and that's why we, we, uh, we have the tendency to create more uh, different lipid nanoparticles with different characteristics. Uh, and then we can do intratumoral injection and obviously intramuscular for vaccine uh, and uh, we do also intracardial injection. So um, basically, uh, what I want to tell you is that uh, the manufacturing process is highly flexible. And one plant can manufacture multiple vaccines and therapeutic at the same time. And these are the scales. You can do uh, batches for a research scale up to 23,500 batches or actually as many batches for many patients you need. So you can really be flexible, and more importantly now, we have the capacity to support at least under clinical trials simultaneously. And this is what I was saying at the beginning, right? <laughs> These are the differences in uh, uh, the big uh, bioreactor is what uh, enzyme replacement therapy uses. So that's the scale of a bioreactor that uh, you use for making uh, um, Elaprase, uh, Fabrazyme, uh, whatever. Uh, once uh, you go into uh, an mRNA manufacturing, uh, the large scale uh, uh, bioreactor is actually what is uh, a tent in size, and that's why you can accommodate as many in a, in a, in a wide areas and support, uh, obviously, uh, many different drugs at the same time. So uh, this is the reason why now uh, we have uh, many candidates uh, as uh, the pipeline as of uh, the end of 2022 uh, has uh, 46 candidates moving forward. Uh, they cover for vaccination and obviously for vaccination we don't modify the uridin because in fact we want to maximize the immune response uh, not only from the lipid nanoparticle but also from the messenger RNA so that you can recruit as many uh, immune cells uh, to the site of injection. But we can do personalized cancer vaccine is a concept that uh, uh, before was uh, um, uh, obviously es uh, explored uh, but the messenger RNA gives you the flexibility of combining uh, many messenger RNA so you can start to be a little bit more precise of what you're going after in, in your tumors. And that's why it gives us the flexibility also to make, for example, nice uh, uh, vaccine because uh, uh, you can build the complexity of the, uh, the, uh, the spike protein uh, in order to produce uh, a, a huge repertoire of different antibodies. So even if you have changes in mutations, uh, you still have some neutralizing antibody binding to the spike protein in different uh, areas. And so uh, you, can, you can now imagine that uh, uh, exploring cancer, personalized cancer vaccine obviously um, infectious diseases, uh, all the other came uh, as, a, as a normal uh, uh, reaction uh, to that. And right now, as I said, we have three clinical trials ongoing for propionic acidemia, methylmalonic acidemia, and uh, glucogen storage uh, disorder type 1A. We'll, uh, we'll file uh, uh, IND for OTC this year and PKU, and also we have uh, a trial ongoing uh, in, uh, for relaxing in uh, cardiovascular diseases. So it's kind of exciting, and uh, uh, because uh, now we are seeing uh, really the, the benefit uh, of uh, using messenger RNA rather than uh, DNA, which has its own issues of integrations. Uh, messenger RNA, once uh, is delivered, it stays into the cytosol, cannot go back to the nucleus, uh, and then eventually gets degraded. Yes, the only disadvantage is that uh, you have to have chronic therapy. On the other hand, uh, uh, chronic therapy uh, of uh, um, in certain diseases could be actually the response rather than always having an over-activated genes that not necessarily is needed once you have receptor saturations. We work very nicely in our body with a positive and negative biofeedback. And I think a messenger RNA can start to reproduce that fluctuation that we have in our body rather than overflowing our system with a lot of protein made from the nucleus with the risk of potentially also affecting chromosomes. And so that's why we are now pursuing many different options for messenger RNA. 
So uh, I want to give you a quick example uh, of uh, uh, one of the originating disorder, uh, which once again, uh, as the vaccine was done in 42 days, uh, <laughs> mainly uh, because uh, uh, we didn't have uh, to do all the studies that sometimes we require in a originating disorder, but also because we had the animal in house, we were able to reproduce the data very fast. I don't know if you are familiar with propionic acidemia. It's an organic acidemia, uh, which is a liver metabolic disorder, where uh, this um, enzyme that is uh, composed by two subunits, uh, PCCA and PCCB, uh, they come together to produce uh, eventually succedyl CoA that goes uh, into the Krebs cycle. So it's a very critical mitochondrial enzyme that uh, uh, is important for these children to process uh, uh, amino acids and protein. So you can imagine that without this enzyme, uh, uh, they can have a metabolic decompensation uh, uh, first as soon as they get the colostrum of the mother and die. And so uh, right now, uh, the, uh, for the children, there's nothing besides uh, liver transplantation as an option, which gives them a longevity of uh, seven, eight more years, uh, and that's it, uh, and, uh, and diet. Uh, and the diet consists of uh, fat uh, and, uh, um, and basically carbohydrate. They cannot uh, eat anything that contains protein or amino acid. So, um, uh, they have a cardiomyopathy, they have renal disease, uh, they develop seizure, uh, they have high level of acid uh, in their body, uh, they have obviously uh, cognitive disorder, so it's a devastating disease, uh, uh, in fact. And, uh, it, and because it's such a critical enzyme, uh, it, it is important, uh, uh, it was important for us uh, to be able to reconstitute uh, uh, for uh, the enzyme in its own function. Patients have mutation either in the subunit A or in the subunit B, but uh, because the messenger RNA now gives you the opportunity to uh, combine a different messenger RNA, now you don't have to discriminate anymore patients that have mutation in A or B, but you can treat them uh, uh, with the combination uh, and uh, actually having a, a, a therapy that uh, treats all patients rather than just a, sub, a subpopulation of them. And so what we have in the lipid nanoparticle is basically two messenger RNA encoding for uh, uh, subunit A and B that eventually they come together, they create the exododecamer uh, 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 within uh, the mitochondria, and then uh, they uh, basically process uh, uh, protein and amino acid. And so we did the first studies because I think in Saudi Arabia there was a study published that showed that carglumic acid was an important agent to drop the level of ammonia. These patients on top of circulating acid, they actually have a high level of ammonia in circulation that obviously has a lot of consequences, including brain damage. And so these patients are generally treated with carglumic acid. And as you can see, the orange bar is carglumic acid, which is very compared to uh, uh, the treatment uh, in terms of uh, messenger RNA, the combination of the two, with the difference uh, that uh, uh, carglumic acid only dropped the level of ammonia, while uh, the messenger RNA was able to drop all the biomarker related to the disease. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, it's published on Nature Communication, we start to see uh, um, uh, weight gain in mice, uh, uh, longevity, survival, and uh, uh, more importantly, we were able to do uh, a repeated dose uh, uh, study uh, in which uh, we saw a consistent uh, and reproducible response uh, to the therapy. To the point that uh, we went uh, out for six months uh, to start to look also at the heart, because uh, as I mentioned initially, these patients have cardiomyopathy. And what we, thought, uh, what we found actually that uh, uh, the therapy also had an impact uh, at the level of the heart rate. So that gave us the opportunity to say, okay, now we have a drug, uh, uh, can uh, uh, reproduce this pharmacology, give us uh, uh, the right therapeutic index, and more importantly, uh, touches on uh, every uh, critical biomarker. And that's why we decided to move it into the clinic. Uh, and this is the summary of uh, what uh, uh, took us uh, basically uh, to, uh, uh, to the clinic. Uh, but more importantly, uh, what was interesting uh, is that uh, we saw this uh, reproducible pharmacology, suggesting that we are not making anti-drug antibody. So this is the study that is ongoing now. It's a phase one, two, uh, uh, multiple ascending dose uh, in patients uh, with propionic acidemia. And uh, we actually uh, finished now, unfortunately I, I cannot show you the latest slides because uh, we haven't announced the data, but we have finished cohort five, which is 0 0.9 milligram per kilogram. 
Um, and uh, uh, FDA was actually, uh, MHRA, they were uh, pretty clear from the very beginning they wanted uh, children from one years of age and above. Uh, uh, they understood the safety of the lipid nanoparticles, so they, in spite of the fact that we are uh, reviewed uh, uh, under gene therapy, they uh, certainly we don't have uh, the, uh, the same safety issues that gene therapy has. And so uh, what is important is that uh, uh, so far, uh, actually now we have more than 10 participants, those uh, more than uh, uh, actually a year and a half doses, which uh, is about 39 doses for certain patients, and they're still responding. So all the patients uh, that they are in the study have uh, decided to automatically enroll in open uh, uh, phase, uh, uh, phase three open label studies. Uh, and. Um, and this is a good news because obviously it seems like there's something happening in these patients and also their quality of life is improving. And more importantly, we didn't see those limiting toxicity. Everything was safe and well tolerated. And some of the initial drug-related adverse events that we saw were mild to moderate. And they were mainly driven by uh, the, um, the infusion, at the moment that we changed the volume and the timing, everything went, uh, went away, and so we can dose these patients normally. This is just a glimpse of what you look on biomarker. 0 0.3 milligram was the minimum, the minimum efficacious dose, and you see uh, we have a very heterogeneous uh, group of patients, so we expected that. But once you start to increase the dose, uh, the, those biomarkers start to become more and more compact, suggesting that, in fact, uh, this could be uh, working. And uh, uh, also, these patients have metabolic decompensation, meaning that they have a high level of acid in circulations, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, damage. They have to show the ER in order to be stabilized. And so we have been discussing with uh, FDA to use metabolic decompensation as a clinical endpoint, and it seems that uh, uh, it's, going to, uh, uh, it's going to go this way, which is great uh, because uh, once uh, we started the study, uh, we have patients that obviously they had a history of metabolic decompensation, and now at 0 0.45 milligram per kilogram, you see that uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, the level of uh, um, uh, metabolic decompensation is reduced to 40, 45%. When we spoke uh, with uh, all the investigators uh, all over the world, they told us that a successful drug would have a reduction of uh, 20% in metabolic decompensation. So this is not even uh, the right dose, uh, but we already see 45% reduction in metabolic decompensation. So I don't make any other comment besides the fact that I'm happy. Uh, anyway, uh, these are, uh, uh, this is the summary. So uh, I would say that the clinical trial is still ongoing. All the patients are enrolling in phase three. Uh, we will have a full panel of uh, uh, the critical biomarker, but more importantly, uh, the metabolic decompensation, uh, if uh, is accepted, uh, it will be a way to uh, not only go for accelerated approval, but for, fa uh, for faster registration, because obviously these patients are doing well. And with this, I want to thank uh, all my colleagues at Moderna. And if you have any questions, sorry, I know that I run a little bit out of time, but I just wanted to uh, give uh, a full overview. So thank you very much. <clears throat>